In this video, I want to explain why we use dependent sampling to sample from the posterior. So, on the left hand side here, I have Bayes' rule. And remember that on the right hand side of this equation, on the denominator, we have a term which is often called the marginal likelihood, which we just cannot usually calculate. And because we cannot calculate that, we have turned towards using sampling as a way of understanding what the posterior looks like. We've thus far covered a type of sampling which is known as independent sampling. So independent sampling is defined as a sampling routine where the next value we draw from a given distribution does not depend on the current value that we have drawn. And the techniques that we've covered thus far to do this are firstly rejection sampling, then we've also looked at inverse transform sampling and we've also looked at importance sampling. So these are all ways that are useful in some aspects of probability theory but it turns out in Bayesian inference that each of these three methods isn't actually that useful for doing inference. The problem with rejection sampling is that whilst it works okay in one dimension it's very inefficient when you move to higher dimensions. In particular, as you scale to higher dimensions, the inefficiency scales exponentially. So that's not the sort of method that is going to avoid the curse of dimensionality that has caused problems for us elsewhere. Secondly, looking at inverse transform sampling, the problem with this method is that firstly, we need a normalized probability distribution. And also, crucially, we also need a cumulative density function, which we normally cannot calculate, especially if the density is unnormalized. And lastly, considering important sampling, this isn't useful typically in doing Bayesian inference because it's hard to choose appropriate importance distributions. Because in important sampling, remember that the variance of your estimates depend crucially on getting the choice of your importance distribution right. And the problem with just choosing an arbitrary importance distribution is that your variance of your estimators, and in this case, for example, estimating the mean, the posterior mean, would be extremely high and it would just not be useful in practice. There has recently been quite a lot of development of methods which are related to important sampling to allow us to do inference, particularly when we look at state space models and that comes under the heading of sequential importance sampling. But vanilla importance sampling on its own tends not to be that useful for Bayesian inference. So it just seems that we can't use independent sampling to do Bayesian inference. So what can we do? Well, it turns out we do a thing which is known as dependent sampling. And I'm going to briefly sort of explain what that means in this lecture. The definition of dependent sampling is where the next value that we sample from a distribution depends on the current value that we've sampled. So dependent sampling all sort of hinges on the fact that we can actually rewrite the posterior as being proportional to the product of the likelihood and the prior. It's proportional to these quantities because all of our theta dependence, in other words, dependence on our parameter, is given by the numerator of Bayes' rule. In the denominator, we only have x, and so that's just a normalizing constant. All of the shape of our distribution is determined by the numerator. So what do I mean by that? Well, the idea is that we could draw lots of different distributions, and so we could draw one that looks something like this, and that might be for one value of the normalizing constant and then for a different value of the normalizing constant we might have a distribution that looks something like this etc. So we have all these sort of family of lots of different distributions all dependent on what the value of the denominator is. However we know that only one of these distributions perhaps the bottom one here has a value of the normalizing constant such that the area underneath it is one. In other words, only one of these distributions is a valid probability distribution. However, what you can see is that the shape of all these distributions is essentially the same. All of the shape is really just given by the numerator of Bayes' rule. 
And so the idea with the pendant sampling is we use this kind of measure of the shape of the distribution to govern how we step about in posterior space. To provide a little more intuition for what's going on in the pendant sampling, let's look at the ratio of the posterior at one value, theta two, compared to another value of theta, theta one, given x. And to calculate this ratio, we can use Bayes' rule up here at the top. So all we get here is p of x given theta two times p of theta two over p of x. And then we divide that through by the same thing, but for theta one, so we get p of x given theta one times p of theta one over p of x. And then the idea here is that the two denominator terms cancel and what we're left with is just p of x given theta two times p of theta two over p of x given theta one times p of theta one. So why have I done this? Well, the idea is that we can calculate exactly the ratio of the posterior at two different values of theta by solely using the ratio of the unnormalized posterior at those respective values of theta. So why is that useful? Well, the idea is that what we could do is we could design a sampler which uses the ratio of the unnormalized posterior at two different points in parameter space. And if we can use that ratio to govern our stepping around parameter space in a way that I haven't really described yet, then the idea is that that gives us a window or it gives us an exact view of what's happening in posterior space. So in other words, we can sample from the posterior by solely using this ratio of the unnormalized posterior. But note by the very fact that we're using this ratio to do our stepping around means that we are considering the posterior value at two different values of theta. And so what we're essentially going to be doing is we're going to be doing a series of local steps around parameter space where we compare the value of our unnormalized posterior at our proposed place that we would step with where we are currently. So we can kind of imagine a routine where we have a parameter theta as our horizontal axis here and our vertical axis here is given by the unnormalized posterior which I'm just going to write with Q of theta. And we can imagine a distribution that might look something like this. And what we can imagine doing is that we start somewhere at random in this landscape, call this theta one. Then what we do is we propose randomly using some sort of stepping distribution, a new location of theta, call it theta two. And then what we do is we calculate the ratio of Q of theta two divided through by Q of theta one. And dependent on that ratio, we want to step to that new location. Otherwise, we stay where we are if that ratio is too small. And in particular, the probability that we accept the step that we proposed should depend on the ratio of the unnormalized posterior. Here, because that ratio is greater than one, we should always accept it because if we're using that as a guide of our probability of stepping around, then probabilities can't be greater than one, so we always step there. Then suppose that we step somewhere else, or propose a step somewhere else, say to theta three. What we can do now is we can calculate the ratio of Q of theta three to theta two, and we could step probabilistically where the probability of us accepting that step is given by this ratio. And here, because Q of theta three is less than theta two, we don't always accept that step. And the idea is that we repeat this process time and time again. And over time, the set of locations that we accept, the theta ones, theta twos, and theta threes in this example, end up being our samples from our posterior distribution. And I should say in passing that the method that I'm gonna describe here is basically that which is known as random walk metropolis. There are other methods that do not involve and accept or reject step, for example, Gibbs sampling, and that's another method of dependent sampling. But I find that this one's the easiest one to describe for people just starting out. 
I now want to illustrate how using this ratio of the unnormalized posterior to govern the probability that we step to a given location can result in samples from our distribution of interest. So here I'm imagining a discrete example where the distribution is defined just at three discrete values of theta and the unnormalized value of the distribution is given by the vertical axis here and so the first column has a height of one the second one has a height of a half, and then the last one has a height of a quarter. So clearly, because these three values don't sum to one, we don't have a valid probability distribution. It's trivial in this example to normalize it, but what I want to illustrate is how we can do kind of this randomized stepping and nonetheless be able to sample from the relevant normalized density. So what we're going to imagine we do here is we start off at theta one, say, then we propose a move to theta two with probability a half. And with probability a half, we propose a move to theta three. Whether we accept either of these moves depends on the ratio of the unnormalized entity at the proposed value to that at the current value. So for the theta two example, what we do is the, the probability that we accept that move is given by Q of theta two divided through by q of theta one, which in this case is just equal to a half divided by one, which is just a half. Then similarly for theta three, our probability that we accept that move is given by the ratio of q of theta three divided through by q of theta one, which is just a quarter over one. So we just get a quarter now. If we reject our proposed move, then the idea is that we stay with theta one. And so if we move to theta two, we then imagine that we've got a proposal, which is with a half probability, we move to theta one, or we propose a move to theta one. And then with a half probability, we propose a move to theta three. If we reject our proposal, then we stay at theta two. And then if we imagine we move to theta three at some point, we're gonna use the kind of same proposal mechanism where with a probability a half, we propose a move to theta one, and with a probability a half, we propose a move to theta two. And in this theta three example, the probability that we accept each of these steps is given by the ratio of the unnormalized density at our new location compared to that at our current one. So here we would calculate Q of theta one divided through by Q of theta three, which if you do that calculation, then you find an answer of four. So because this ratio is greater than one, what does that tell us? It tells us we always accept proposals to theta one. And similarly, if you calculate the ratio of Q of theta two to Q of theta three, then now you get a half divided by a quarter, so you get two. And because that's greater than one, we always accept a move to theta two. So from theta three, we can see that we're never going to stay at theta three. For theta two, the situation is slightly more complicated because if we propose a move to theta three, then we move with probability a half. Whereas if we move, propose a move to theta one, then we always move because theta one has a higher value of the unnormalized posterior compared to our current value. So what we can do is we can represent this kind of situation using what is known as a Markov state diagram, which looks something like that, which I'm drawing now. And basically we imagine that there are three states given by these three circles, except that we are now just moving between these three states with relative probabilities. So if we actually go through and calculate the probability of moving from theta one to theta two, what do we get? Well, we get the probability that we propose theta two times the probability that we accept that proposal, which is another half. So the probability that we move from theta one to theta two is going to be given by a quarter, and I'm just going to write it in eights here because it's actually easier because then everything can be written in eights. So that's the probability that we move from theta one to theta two. Similarly, we can calculate the same thing going back the other direction. So now this is the probability that we move from theta two to theta one. Well, we can calculate that probability because here the probability we propose theta one from theta two is a half, multiply it by the probability we accept that, which is one. In other words, we get four eighths or a half moving back in that direction. And similarly, I can fill out all of the other transitions here. And so we see that actually in the case of theta three, 
that actually the probability of staying at theta three is zero. So that's perhaps one of the other things that you point out in this diagram. Now what I want to show is that we can actually simulate this process which is governed by this Markov transition diagram here. I don't want to worry too much about the maths of how we simulate that. But what we shall see that is that even though we start at a random starting location, I've just chosen to start here at, at theta one, after we do this kind of stepping routine for only a few iterations, we get a distribution which looks very much like the true distribution. So importantly here, I'm not gonna be actually doing the sampling. I'm just gonna show, because I can analytically calculate, how our sampling distribution, if we were to follow this routine, would evolve over time. In this graph that I've created in Mathematica, I have the true distribution here, which is the normalized version of that which I drew, which is shown here in blue. And this is a normalized distribution. You can check this. It's got values of four sevenths, two sevenths, and one seventh, and those add up to one. So it is a valid probability distribution. And here on the left, in orange, I've shown the sampling distribution. And because we start off at position theta one, the probability that we're anywhere else other than theta one is just zero. Then after one iteration of our algorithm, we see that now the probability that we're at theta one has gone down significantly, and we can calculate the probabilities we're at theta two and at theta three. And because the ratio of the probability at theta two to theta one is greater than that compared to theta three to theta one, much more of our probability mass has shifted over to theta two than it has to theta three. But we see that already, even after one iteration of our alg algorithm, even though we started off deterministically in a place, we are very, very close to the true distribution. And as I run my sampler further, we see that after two iterations, now the difference between the sampling distribution in orange and the true one is negligible. And that distance gets even smaller as I run my sampling algorithm further and further. And so after only relatively few iterations, here I've got 10, you basically cannot differentiate a difference between these distributions. And so we've seen here that we can use dependent sampling to sample from a distribution without knowing the normalized value of that density. And indeed, all you need to use is the ratio of unnormalized densities at a proposal value and compare it to the current value.